you, especially being on this panel with this esteemed group of individuals. We're talking today oil and geopolitics, especially in the next century. If we take a look back at the last century, we know for a fact that the 20th century saw access to energy become a major factor in determining the winners and the losers of the last century. The winners of wars, it put together allegiances and alliances and pulled together bonds that have changed the planet. This next century will be as significantly, I believe, disruptive because of new energy sources and the fact that the decentralization, there will be issues coming up in this next century with everything from transportation to ensuring integrity of your energy supply. And it needs to be addressed, I think, openly and discussed in a way that you know, we can anticipate what will happen in the, 20, in the next century. So really, I wanted to kind of start this question off to all of you. When you take a look at the fact that we have new sources of energy that will be disruptive, new bonds being formed between countries, there's questions right now as to whether or not the supply of energy globally is safe from a million of different perspectives. I'm going to start with you, Jafar. Mm -hmm. What should we be looking at right this minute when you take a look at the fact that oil prices today are where they're sitting and everybody in the world is wondering, are they going up, are they going down? But at the same time, when you see the burgeoning development of natural gas, which will be a competitor, allowing countries to kind of pull themselves out of this global chain and supply themselves. What will this do, I think, in the next century to disrupt the entire geopolitical process in the world? Thank you, Montel. Um, good morning, everyone. I think I started my career when the price was in the region of about $10. It reached about $10 a barrel at the time in the, in the mid and late 90s. So at that time, it was predicted it was the end of the oil industry as we know it, and the oil industry bounced back. So we do see the oil industry having a habit of boom and bust. However, I think, as you rightly pointed out, in this, say, in this situation, the fundamentals are shifting. The whole balance is shifting. Oil is becoming less important, um, and we have to accept that. But I think it will be gradual. In other words, I think it could bounce back. Today, natural gas is oversupplied, oil is oversupplied. The U.S. has shown a remarkable robustness. Uh, it was predicted that the U.S. shale would decline, and it has declined, but not to the extent that it was predicted. So in answer to your question, I think it's a ominous sign that the oil industry is in decline, but there is still the fundamentals and there is still the opportunity for oil to bounce back. However, if it bounces back this time, we shouldn't expect $100 um, a barrel. In some, in some, in short, it's becoming less important. Jim, what do you think? Well, uh, I think that uh, the situation, particularly in this part of the world, is dominated by two important developments. One is the imperial behavior of uh, three powers, those being Russia, Iran, and ISIS. ISIS, not yet an empire perhaps, but as a caliphate wanting to become one. And those three empires uh, moving against their neighbors, undermining them with terrorist attacks uh, such as uh, Iran uh, with the Houthi in Yemen and on and on, Hezbollah, so forth, Hamas. Um, the uh, Russians uh, with uh, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, on and on. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we have a serious problem in that all three have used and are using, want to use, oil and, in Russia's case, gas, uh, as a weapon of increasing their imperial power. That ability on their part is being undercut by a couple of technological developments. One of those is increasing uh, availability of oil substitutes through technology, 
And the other is the increasing availability of oil substitutes through not only new fuels, but also uh, the use of waste, for example, uh, to create transportation fuel. And finally, the use of electricity to substitute for oil, particularly as batteries get better and it becomes more and more practical to have uh, vehicles, at least in part, propelled by electricity rather than by uh, liquid fuels. Um, so our three imperial powers, or ambit ambitiously imperial if they haven't quite made it yet, uh, are running into some technological problems in using oil and gas, and gas of course available through fracking, uh, in much of the world, especially in China, but in other parts as well. So those technological developments are undermining that imperial power that those three empires would like to exercise, and that's producing and will continue to produce a great deal of tension in particularly this part of the world. Go, I have a question for you. In 1943, 1943, Hofford John McKinder stated, someday, incidentally, when coal and oil are exhausted, the Sahara may become the trap for capturing direct power from the sun. That was written back in 1943. As we look now, that's about to start happening today. What will be the impact of, as Jim brought up, there are so many different alternative, renewable, different choices in energy that can help individual countries loosen the grip of other countries on them by providing themselves with their own energy, especially if you go from what Jim had just mentioned, some of the technologies that are out there now that can literally produce oil and electricity from waste matter. What will this impact be over the next 10 years? Why, why are we talking about oil? I mean, I think we don't talk about coffee, we don't talk about copper, we don't talk about corn. All of these commodities, by the way, have seen ups and downs, very dramatic, much more dramatic than oil, by the way, uh, but we don't talk about them. Uh, we talk about oil because of two reasons. One is it's the most voluminous and valuable commodity uh, in the world in the sense that, just think about the United States. How much oil the United States uses every day? If you had to build a container to contain the amount of oil, 18 million barrels, that America alone uses every single day, what would be the size of this container? It would be the size of the Twin Towers, the late Twin Towers, okay? That's how much oil America uses every single working day. So it's a very big chunk of commodity uh, and the value of oil around the world is bigger than all the gold, all the stocks, all the bonds, uh, all the sovereign debt put together. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a, a big elephant in the room. But the more important reason why we talk about oil is because oil has a status that no other commodity has. It is, uh, has a status of monopoly over the transportation sector. Transportation underlies trade. Trade underlies the global economy. And one commodity controls all of the transportation sector. Cars, trucks, ships, planes. They cannot run on anything other than crude oil products. That's why we care about oil. In electricity, for example, we can use coal, we can use gas, we can use nuclear, we can use solar, wind, you name it. And they can all compete against each other. Your light bulb doesn't care who made the electrons. It's agnostic as to how the electrons were made. But your car does care. It tells you, I can only run on oil products. So uh, we try to explain this uh, 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 situation, conundrum that we are in. Uh, a few years ago, my colleague Annie Corin and myself, we wrote a book uh, called Turning Oil into Salt. And we argued in this book that oil today has the same strategic importance as another commodity, salt, used to have throughout, throughout human history. Because throughout human history, up until about 200 years ago, salt was the most important commodity in the world because it had a monopoly over food preservation. If you wanted to survive the winter, you needed to cure the food with salt. 
And if you didn't have salt, you'd, you'd starve in the winter. And uh, uh, until the invention of canning and refrigeration, salt had the same strategic importance as oil has today. And wars were actually fought over salt, believe it or not. And places like Tartuga, Boa Vista, Turk Island, places that we haven't heard about maybe today, in those days were the most important places in the world, like, like the Abu Dhabis and Saudi Arabias of our own age. So that's why we talk about oil. And if you want to look at the future and understand what we need to do in order to break the strategic importance of oil, so it's not that critical to our life, just as salt is not critical to our life. I mean, we, we, we consume more salt than ever before, and we import more salt than ever before, but if you use too much salt, you probably going to hear about it from a, your cardiologist, but not uh, read about it in the New York, New York Times. That, that what we have to do is to create competition. And competition needs to happen in the transportation sector. Just like we have competition of commodities and choice of commodities in the electricity sector. And you have to do it by changing the platforms, the vehicles, the cars, the trucks, the ships, and planes. Open them up, open them up so that natural gas can come in and electricity can come in, bringing all the solar and the wind and all of these things, and the tires, everything is, you know. Today, there is a gateway that prevents competition from taking place. And unless we unleash or break the, the, those barriers to competition, oil will continue to have a monopoly status and with that come everything that we're seeing today. Patrick, you're part of the Chinese China Energy Fund Committee. Yes. And just what Gall is talking about, there are so many new technologies that could, over the next 10 years, if actually invested in, could put a dent in this stronghold. Everything from paralysis, uh, liquid molten salt decomposition, things like um, uh, Gasification, not gasification, but paralysis, nuclear power. If we were putting more money into these alternatives, would we not then be able to loosen this grip on oil? Absolutely. I agree totally with you. Right now, the problem is not only monopoly of, the, of oil over the transportation sector, but also oil is so expensive, it's so pristine. In China, we use oil just solely to support the transportation sector. And we're not using oil to, 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 to run the turbines because we can use nuclear, we can use coal, you can use hydroelectric and all those things. However, the problem with diversification is in storage. Now we can, we can have all the winds and all, this, all the hydroelectric and all this solar, but what if the wind is not blowing? What if the sun is not shining? What if the water is not running? The problem is in storage. But most recently, China has put a lot of emphasis in, on research and development in battery technology. If you go to Shenzhen, which is the southern part of China, just north of Hong Kong, you can see battery factories, battery laboratories. You can see the most famous, uh, the BYD factories there. This is a whole, the, the, it's just sprung with with laboratories and factories designed for the betterment improvement of battery technologies. And battery technologies is what will be disruptive in the energy equation today, just as the shell technology is of yesterday. So I would say that with the advent of new technology, with battery, with storage of energy, I think we can really salvage and, and really expand the fields of applications of the, of the renewables. How, Jafar, how about in the next century, though, again, if we continue down this path, finding batteries to store the energy made in a centralized place and then try to then move that energy out to far reaching all of this dissipation of energy, why are we not looking at decentralizing, making grids much more modular? You would be able to supply energy to a small community if that small community was able to run, let's say, a small paralysis device where they could take all of their waste energy, including human waste, everything. Mm -hmm. Use that in smaller sectors 
Why are we not looking towards building smaller grids rather than trying to figure out a way to drive energy down the last century's grid, which we know is as inefficient as anything on the planet? Well, I think the simple answer to that is two things, the politics and infrastructure, and the two go hand in hand. The infrastructure of oil and gas is huge. Correct. And substituting that infrastructure, if you were to go towards battery technology or if you were to go towards solar, uh, it's quite an undertaking. What would you do? How would you transfer that infrastructure? Assuming tomorrow we found the magic substitute and oil became irrelevant, you still have this huge infrastructure, which is a centralized planning situation, which is centrally planned by governments, which is built. Perhaps the opportunity today is the big countries in the region, namely Iraq, Iran, maybe Yemen, maybe Syria, their infrastructure is in such a bad state that that could be the opportunity for a more decentralized and modular infrastructure. But again, I don't feel that the renewable um, or the alternative energy has reached a point where, I mean, the scales don't even work well in, in most of Western Europe. So they're definitely going to have a challenge working here. So in our lifetime, we're kind of compelled to depend on hydrocarbons, I believe. Um, and you can see solar, battery technology, uh, waste management, making slow inroads. But if you actually see the consumption mix today of, the, of these alternatives, they're still very low. And I think the, also the investment culture hasn't reconciled itself with this big centrally planned oil and gas and electricity projects that this region is, is, is used to. The, the whole idea of modularism with the exception maybe of the UAE and some Gulf states. It hasn't really caught on in the region. So it's, I'll add a, a third thing besides infrastructure and, 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 and sort of political system. It's the business culture as well that's needed to change to embrace that. Jim, from a security standpoint, one strategically placed oil tanker in one strategic waterway makes an immediate need to change this global distribution. How do we continue to look down the road and the thinking that we have the next 30 to 40 years before technology catches up? Should we not be looking at this? Technology needs to catch up as quick as it possibly can. I think the technology is available to move relatively rapidly toward distributed generation uh, uh, from both uh, waste products and from uh, solar. Uh, and uh, to do a good deal of the storage. Uh, the batteries are improving uh, rather rapidly, uh, lithium, iron, iron, uh, phosphate. Uh, there's just a lot going on in those areas. The problem is that we have to recognize the urgency and the vulnerability that exists today in our infrastructure. The electric grid is connected to everything. We have 18 critical infrastructures in the United States. 17 of them depend on electricity, on the electric grid. So if the grid goes down, let's say through hacking, the way the Russians hacked into the Ukrainian uh, grid not long ago, if the grid goes down, it's not just the lights that go out. It's the water pumps. It's the food deliveries. Uh, it's the financial information. It's the banking structure. Lots go down, of things go down. And we continue happily to kind of amble along as if this overconnected structure that we've got is just kind of an inconvenience. It's not just an inconvenience. It is a huge vulnerability, really, for most countries. Now, the less infrastructure you have, like, say, North Korea, in a sense, maybe the less vulnerable you are to getting things knocked out. The more you're doing by hand, the more you're living already still in the 19th century, in a sense, uh, the less vulnerable you are. But if everything is connected to everything else and your control systems are over the web, uh, so lots and lots of people can get into the control systems, uh, you have a vulnerability that could put us back uh, major sections of the world in the event of uh, intentional taking down of uh, the grid. Uh, you could be back uh, in the world of the 19th century without nearly enough uh, plow horses, uh, seeds, and uh, whatever else you might 
need in order to live a 19th century agricultural existence. Well, Carl, that's a very interesting point because though we say this pie in the sky may never happen, this literally is one group, one organization, one terrorist group away from total disruption of, let's say, the U.S. grid. I, I wanted to ask the question, Jim, of why is it that the United States is so reluctant to decentralize? We'll come back to that. Well, it, it's basically the structure of our uh, utilities and our electricity uh, uh, regulation. Uh, the utilities have not been helpful uh, on this issue. They like continuing to manage centralized structures. They can move uh, electricity from one place to another and satisfy the needs. And as long as there is no intentional interference, as long as all they have to deal with is uh, uh, branches knocking against uh, uh, wires in a storm or squirrels uh, nibbling away on connections, as long as all, that's all they have to deal with, the utilities are fine. But if they have to deal with not just malignant type problems in a theoretical sense, uh, but malevolent ones, that is somebody planning to take down the grid, as long as they are trying to deal with that, they're not comfortable, they're not happy, they don't know what to do, and they would just as soon not have to work on it. Well, how do we overcome this now for the United States, but in the rest of the world, uh, in places in the EU? There's laws against fracking, there's laws against collecting or producing your own electricity. How do we get this decentralization idea to catch on? Uh, first of all, I want to try to dispel uh, a myth that even I believed in for many years, and that is that those uh, bad actors, and I'm not talking about electricity because I think on the electricity side you're absolutely right, but on the oil side, uh, that the bad actors somehow could create a major uh, global disruption. Uh, I think what we're seeing today is very interesting. I mean, the Middle East has never been as volatile as it is today, and yet the impact on the price of oil is, is zero. In fact, when Saudi Arabia and Iran were almost uh, cut diplomatic relations, there was a lot of tension, the price of oil actually went down. It didn't even respond to this. So uh, we're seeing countries, major oil producing countries being knocked out of the market and no impact at all on the, on the price. Uh, so I think gone are the days that every little disruption here or there is sort of causing a major uh, crisis in the markets. Uh, what drives the market today is the uh, Saudi attempt to knock out the American oil producing uh, shale operators uh, out of North Dakota and Texas and Louisiana uh, because simply uh, Saudi Arabia refuses to cut back on production because they hope that if they keep the price low enough for long enough, the folks in America will go bankrupt because they all borrowed money from the banks on the basis that they can produce, sell the oil for $100 a barrel. Uh, and last year, 60 companies went bankrupt. The, this year, probably another 150 will go bankrupt. And so this strategy will probably work because those guys cannot last long uh, and they cannot recycle their debt. Now, you asked a very important question. Why technology doesn't kick in? And the reason is, I think, because of volatility. Technology doesn't have a life of its own. Technology are, is people that want to make money. Now, people can make money at $30 oil, and they can make money at $100 oil, but they cannot make money that one day is 30 and the next day is 100. It, the, this volatility is killing everybody. And therefore, we have to address the issue of volatility. The only way to prevent volatility, or to, to calm down the volatility, is by competition. Because if you, have, uh, if you like to drink coffee, and the price of coffee goes up, you drink tea, you drink cocoa, but th th therefore no commodity can spike too much because if it gets too expensive, people will shift on the fly to something else. When it comes to transportation, because we don't have the competition, everything that can happen in the market created a violent response upward and downward. And this volatility is, was, is killing the prospects of technology. So I say, let's deal with the volatility by first introducing competition, do it through opening the platforms 
on which the fuels can compete. For example, make cars that are flexible fuel vehicles so that more fuels can, or natural gas vehicles or electric vehicles. And then that will straighten the volatility and then technology can kick in. Patrick, and recently China just changed regulations allowing for more than one child, which is going to represent 70 million new births yes, a right. year. Seven zero yes, new right. births a year. Yes, yeah. um, if, if we get the, looking at the next 10 years, 700 million people, that's more consumption of oil going into China than the United States of America times three. So why are we not looking in a place like China that could impact this technological energy technology revolution by pushing forward? You talk about batteries, but you're also very dependent on coal. What other technologies do you think could be disruptive enough that could help China fulfill some of its own energy needs without extracting it from the rest of the world? Because once we're getting 700 million new people in 10 years, <laughs> my goodness. Mantel, you asked a very good question and very timely so, because right at this time, the people in Beijing is meeting what is called the two meetings, meaning the National People's Congress is, is just meeting in Beijing right now. And in that meeting, they're rolling out the 13 five-year plan. Well, the 13 five-year plan, what the central core of that message was about energy consumption, energy usage. There are many energy policy, energy strategy, energy plans rolled out in many countries, but in Essentially, every one of them is to get more, more, more. Get more of this and get more of that and get more of that. But in this 13 five, uh, five year plan that rolled out in China, the first thing that was trying to say to its people is use less. The first thing that government say is use less energy. Conservation is increase the energy intensity, meaning that we have to get more efficient and also put a ceiling of the total, of, of total consumption of energy for, this, for the country for the next five years. The ceiling is set at 44.8 billion tons of coal equivalent, which means that it's, it's really uh, 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 exerting a limitation of how much China is spending on energy. And so that is very important uh, as far as using energy is concerned. The second major point is self-sufficiency. It's setting a floor of importation of energy, meaning that the self-sufficiency is set at 85%. The most that China can import for the next five years is 15% of its energy use. I want to open it up to some questions from members of the audience. I have microphones on each side of the stage. If you want to come up, as soon as I see someone there, I'll take a question. And I'll come back, though, again. But when you just talk about the amount of coal over the next five years, again, yeah. there are technologies now that are at least being introduced that, if funded appropriately, would be a cleaner way to process coal. And even in some ways, you can turn coal in the same process, or using fissotrope, into a liquid fuel. Absolutely. Why are you not, are you, or is China looking at that? Absolutely. China is not putting a lot of resources in developing clean coal technology. Gotcha. Clean coal technology, because we, China has more coal than it can use. China, one thing that China has is a lot of coal, very little oil, and no gas. That's what China has, all right? But it has so much coal that to, not to use coal is really to deprive its people of cheap and available and accessible energy. So it has to use coal, but we have to use coal responsibly. Sure. So we are developing a, 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 a lot of technologies in and putting a lot of money and resources in developing clean coal technology. Because with coal, not only they can generate electricity, coal can be turned to liquids. No question. Turn be coal to turn into gas. Yes, sir, and I'll get your question. Yes, China sir. has very little gas unless it gets into fracking. Shell. If it gets into fracking, it has more gas than any country in the world. Yes, sir. Derek Johansson from the Manitoba chapter in Canada. You know, I love this concept of if you get more competition, it will bring more stability because we have more options. And you, you brought up the concept of batteries. It, it appears that every time we look at an option, there's a, a byproduct, a waste. What do you do when, you know, when the battery's not usable anymore and it's difficult to get rid of? 
Can you speak to that, like as we look at other options to reduce the dependence and increase the competition on oil, what are some of those impacts that come after the fact? So I've, I've used up my battery, what do I do with it now? You recycle it. Uh, most of the materials, a battery is essentially a box full of commodities, by the way. A box full of commodities, mostly commodities, a little bit of IP. But a battery is mainly lithium, cobalt, rare earth elements, mm -hmm. nickel, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that, those things can be recycled, provided there is enough scale and the economies of scale work. Uh, in terms of the other alternatives that I am uh, very bullish about, is um, um, you know, natural gas and coal and biomass uh, can be turned into a liquid uh, called methanol, not ethanol, methanol with an M. Um, and and uh, methanol uh, is an alcohol. In China, cars already run on methanol, and it can be blended into our gasoline, just like we blend ethanol, but without the subsidies. <laughs> And, 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 and um, that's a liquid. And it can be blended at any ratio, just like you mix coffee and milk, OK? Now, to make a car being able to run on methanol and, and gasoline blends, it costs an extra $100 per car. That's what it costs, $100 extra per car to make the car being able to run on methanol. It's called a flexible fuel engine. So that's a simple solution in which we can open cars to competition. If automakers make the cars flexible fuel, we'd open the door to methanol made from coal, made from natural gas, made from biomass, made from whatever has carbon in it. And then you have another player competing against uh, petroleum fuels uh, at, as I said, $100 extra per car. Yes, sir. Over here. Fan fantastic panel. Thanks very much. Um, my question is, as you look into your crystal ball, what are the one or two scenarios you see most likely for where this plays out? What are the implications for that for global strategic alliances and political realignment? And from that, what business opportunities will come out of that? Thank you. I'm going to jump. You want me to take one at a time? No. I'm going to let Jim jump in, but I think part of this question was, again, as you're looking at those alternatives, and I'll throw out again, there's technology. We, we act right now. And most people in the energy field have, have kind of stagnated, thinking that we're stuck with paralysis, uh, 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 arcs, and, and various gasification. But there's more technology coming online every day. Right now, there's, a, there's this idea of liquid molten salt decomposition, which literally is end-of-life carbon, carbonaceous material. So carbonaceous material that can then be turned into a syngas, run out, and powering things from a syngas standpoint, mm -hmm. and then fissiotrope down to a liquid gas. These are the kind of technologies that I think would answer some of the questions if money was put into how do we get YPO to invest in new technology and answer his question at the same time. Jim, I'll start with you and then I'll come back to you. Um, I'm afraid I have a propensity to look at the dark side of things <laughs> sometimes. And uh, the dark side of the possibilities that you suggested, one of them would be Russian aggression against one of the, Bal one of the Baltic states. Uh, they uh, might do it the way they did it uh, against Crimea and against Ukraine and against Georgia. Um, but uh, however they do it, a Russian move against uh, one of the Baltics, which all three of which are members of NATO, would create a great stress within uh, uh, Europe and within uh, the US and in the whole NATO structure. And figuring out how to deal with that, particularly as Russia utilizes its ability to withhold uh, natural gas from uh, Europe, um, is a potentially very serious problem, to, uh, to put it mildly. And I think it would be uh, uh, behoove all of the national leaders of NATO countries to uh, rather quietly get together and try to sort through this and figure out how they can make a coordinated, strong, powerful response to a Russian move of that sort, because uh, I think uh, it's exactly the kind of thing Mr. Putin would think of doing. Yes, sir. So we talk about technology. I think technology is very important, but we need to take into consideration the political, geopolitical implications as the last question. Uh, said, and I think on that, I foresee 
the demise of superpowers in the region giving way to regional powers. Regional powers are going to be a lot more relevant, I think, in playing, in playing out in the region. And technology depends on the emerging political system and impacts the emerging political system. So, as an example, if we go back the last two years briefly, uh, Iraq produced two million barrels a day extra production from in, the, in the past two years. That was credited to, ch to China. China, in 2010 or 2008, started to take commercial risks in Iraq that no other Western oil company would take. And they were actually responsible. I mean, the Iraq, Iraqis didn't produce it by just putting on a light switch. China was responsible for the two million extra production. So you could say China is responsible for the price, in large part, for the price today. So when we're talking about technology, I think we have to talk about commercial risk. I've never heard of a strategic renewable energy project which pools together government, private sector in the region. I've never even heard of a strategic oil project which pulls these which pulls these entities together. There's individual investments. But in China's case, it was strategic investments which redefined the commercial landscape. Um, and I think that's where we should be talking because it's a commercial issue rather than a technology issue, I feel. What do you think, Go? We've got to make money here. It's not about... I mean, I was very troubled mm -hmm. yesterday, by the way, what Kofi Annan said, you know, that the government needs... The governments need to come together and subsidize and... and Bad idea, okay? Bad idea. Whenever the government decides to subsidize something, you know, run, <laughs> run, run for the exit, okay? So, so we don't want that. We want people like you guys to find something good, uh, make sure that the regulatory environment enables it to go through the market uh, 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 swiftly and make a lot of money. Um, and I think that the big bottleneck today is not actually in the production of energy. A lot of folks are in the upstream, drilling and fracking and building all kinds of things. Where is the big bottleneck today? Is in the midstream. Because the commodities cannot go to market. The energy cannot go to market, cannot be stored, cannot be shipped. Think about natural gas. 90% of the natural gas in the world today is being piped in pipelines, which means connecting countries. Only 10% of the natural gas that is being traded around the world is shipped in a maritime uh, between countries in, in the form of LNG. And, but many countries cannot build LNG. They're just not too big enough, not rich enough, and they are stranded. They, can, they would love to have natural gas to replace coal and oil, with natural, but they just cannot enter the market. LNG is too expensive for them to to enter. So we've got to find solutions that enable us more trade, more movement, more, more midstream activity, and shift a lot of the investment from the upstream to the midstream and the downstream. Because otherwise, we're going to become flooded with all of those sources of energy. We're not going to be able to use it. By the way, most of the solar energy today that is being generated is unused. So what's the point in creating so much energy and it goes to, to garbage? It, it, it's not being used. We've got to optimize the system by investing throughout the supply chain, from upstream, midstream, downstream equally, but not through government. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to connect three things. Uh, yesterday, we talked about Moore's Law, which brought the chip cost to penny from 1980 to 2016. It's 36 years. A chip cost has come to penny. Can battery cost come to, when battery cost come to penny, what will happen to the energy? pool overall. So we are assuming certain assumptions are, which is based on the past, not based on the future. The solar impulse, that we are assuming that transportation will need fuel all the time. Solar impulse experiment, which was there, it is, that is a transportation experiment, which is not based on the oil as underlying factors. So by connecting three things which we discussed yesterday, can we look at the future differently? I'll, yes, sir. I'll take on part of that. There may be others. Um, utilizing innovative ways to do transportation is extremely important. 
Gal Luft has, has given us guidance on one important uh, direction, uh, reforming the midstream, making it possible for cars and uh, trucks and ships, for that matter, everything, to be able to use uh, uh, something other than petroleum-based fuels. What uh, one uh, can do is with cars, let's say the family car, for the cost of a five kilowatt hour battery, which is not huge, one can get enough electricity overnight to drive about 20 or 25 miles a day. Then one becomes, one's car becomes just a regular hybrid and it uses efficiently a liquid fuel and the electricity that it's generated. But for the first 20, 25 miles, it's all electric. That's not a big trick. The Chevy Volt has been doing this for years. Um, but one of the things that, what that does is it means that half the cars in the country are all electric every day because the average distance it goes only 20, 25 miles. What that sa says is don't be ideological about whether a vehicle uses just liquid fuel or just electricity. You don't have to pick. Let it use both. Take the, the advantages of both, and with liquid fuels, hopefully made from something other than petroleum, with liquid fuels and with electricity, you can basically do today a great deal of what you want to do in terms of moving off petroleum-based fuels. Absolutely. Yes, sir. It's working. If capacity is 20 times the storage capacity of battery in the next five years, as per the Moore's law, if it, because it goes by the exponential manner, and solar power capacity increased by 10 times, it is a 200 times impact on the same kind of capacity which can drive the car, will it changes the entire equation of the belief system. God, I just want to explain to you very quickly why there cannot be Moore's law in batteries. Because as I said before, 70% of the cost of batteries is commodities. Commodities did not exhibit Moore's law. Okay, so from the get-go, 70% of the cost of the box will not uh, uh, be applicable to the Moore's law theory. Uh, the, the, maybe in the other 30%, you could see a uh, steep decline in price, but not in commodities. Directly on this point, <laughs> uh, I was at a breakfast at Caltech uh, several years ago. Someone asked me what I was looking into. I said, I'm looking into batteries and into, uh, uh, and into uh, solar. And they said, uh, uh, I said, but you know, the batteries are changing for the better, but they're not on a Moore's Law curve. Uh, and a fellow, an older fellow, two people down from me at the table said, well, you know, they don't need to be on a Moore's Law uh, curve. Uh, they didn't have nearly as far to go as we did. And I started to explain to the gentleman Moore's Law, and happily, for some reason, I paused because it was Moore. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one more question. Yes, sir, in the middle. Good, good morning. Uh, good topic and a great panel. Um, I like your idea of uh, opening the competition through the alternative platforms. But we also understand the political will and the agreement would be very critical. I'm coming from the country that has no oil resources. However, our state budget is actually significantly rely, reliant on uh, the consumption taxes. So if the politicians and the businesses should agree in the future on opening the competition, what would be the effect to the governments that actually build their finance income on not, not the income from the oil uh, production, but from the oil consumption? through the consumption taxes. And Call what is the alternative for the governments actually to get more less vulnerable by losing the, this income? I want you to answer this, but I also want to add a little piece to this, because as you talked about doing this in the midstream, infrastructure still has to change. And governments are responsible for that form of infrastructure. If we get in the midstream, just, we're just talking cars and transportation, that's one thing. But when we're talking about energy storage, we have to have lines and, 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 and uh, cabling and, and the ability to move energy from one place to the other without as much dissipation. Right now, I don't think we send a kilowatt hour across a line without losing probably 15% of it for every 75 yards that it runs. 
So how do we adjust? Because you're going to need governments to put in infrastructure. Not No? No. Okay? No. Yes, <laughs> Again, run to the exits. <laughs> Run government should not be in the business of building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Government should be in the business of eliminating barriers to competition. S government needs to streamline the regulations that prevent from competition to occur. Government should be friendly to entrepreneurs and people who are willing to risk uh, their investments. This is the role of government. The single most important role of government is to protect us, and after that, to enable markets to work. So I'm not expecting governments to build anything. I want the government to enable people like us to do what we're good at in a way that is, doesn't compromise public safety, of course. I mean, we don't want to kill people in the process, but this is as far as it goes. I think that if we... Uh, and by the way, I'm not worried about how a government is going to tax us. If they, if, if, well, they, they will tax us for breathing if they could. Uh, and they will, by the way, one day. Uh, but, 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 but we shouldn't be worried about how they make their money. They will always find ways to do it. But if we find ways for more competition to occur, first of all, we'll be more resilient. We will not be, uh, be beholden to one to the fluctuations of the commodities and to one country's, uh, certain countries in the world uh, uh, having um, inordinate power and so forth. But more important, we will stimulate economic growth, which is vastly needed. I mean, let's face it, we're not growing today. Almost nobody is growing today. And we've got to open the sector that offers the most opportunities for making money, which is energy. And that's where the growth potential is. So all I think the government should do is move a little bit out of the way. That, that, that would contribute enormously to our cause. Sorry, sir, we are out of time. <laughs> I'm going to get some closing remarks. Patrick, do you have uh, anything in closing? Well, one thing is that uh, a lot of people talk about energy, energy, energy. But I think we should talk about using less and less and less. I, I, <laughs> arousing applause. And I, I'm not going to say that I don't believe that we should attempt to do that, but the reality is that as we get more, we want to consume more, I believe. So it's going to be a tough sell. Jim, do you want to close your remarks? I would just say that as we move into alternatives to petroleum-based uh, fuels, and as we move into new ways to generate electricity and particularly store it better, there are some fantastic opportunities uh, out there uh, for, uh, I think, making money based, as Gal has suggested, should be our number one objective, uh, based on these uh, technological changes. But they do substantially entail getting out from under the thumb of government regulation. Government regulation of electricity, which is the one I have spent the most time on, uh, is the main problem in terms in the United States, in terms of being able to have a resilient electric grid. The problem, the big problem is that the util is the utilities, uh, not anything else. Jafar? Just briefly, I think the outside view of this region is don't look at the Middle East as one big oil well. It is um, a place of very diverse energy opportunity. Um, and I think uh, the issue of investments and the issue of business, the commercial issue, the non-technology non issue, going together with the technology issue is the only thing that's actually going to make it happen and take it from theory to reality. Ladies and gentlemen, our nine o'clock panel. Thank you.